Hello everybody, this is Knut Eriksen from Denmark from the two-day seminar in May 2011. Uh, we've just finished the seminar, it was very interesting and I have here with me uh, the last of the, actually we had six professors, imagine that, six professors uh, in Denmark uh, talking about this subject and uh, the last one which I just had the chance to meet here and uh, we'll have a little talk with is uh, Dr. Alexander Jacob. Uh, Dr. Jacob is an international re renowned scholar of history of ideas and English literature. He's from India, Madras, but he's worked all over the world actually. He has uh, worked in mostly in Canada, I think, uh, and he um, he started off after his uh, Indian beginnings, he started off in, in England, then he has been, as I said, in, in, uh, in Toronto, Canada, but he's also been in many other places in the United States and uh, in, in Europe. So welcome Dr. Jacob, nice, <laughs> nice to meet you and thank you for joining me here. Um, now it's obviously uh, obvious to most people who see this that you are not uh, a, a very likely uh, participant in a sort of white course uh, seminar. How come you, you, you got this interest? Well, uh, I'm interested in uh, all uh, nationalist cultures and the preservation of uh, local traditions uh, in an age of uh, international uh, multiculturalism and globalization. So, uh, uh, I was invited uh, because of my books, the books that I've written on uh, idealistic uh, natural philosophy and political philosophy. Mm. So, so you came quite natural that uh, from being a resident of India um, and you learned English literature, I understand, was your, uh, your first studies. And you were somehow you somehow ended up in, 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 in England, but from there on you 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 went on to uh, to uh, more like German literature, German philosophy, German history. How did that come about? Yes, um, uh, when I did my doctorate in America, I uh, chose a philosopher from the 17th century uh, who uh, was a Neoplatonist. Uh, English philosopher and Who was that? Henry Moore, and he's a Cambridge philosopher of the Renaissance. And I chose him because Neoplatonism comes closest to Indian philosophy. And um, Neoplatonism, of course, is a form of Platonism, which is an idealistic philosophy. And uh, when I studied uh, idealistic philosophy further, I found that it was most fully developed in Germany. Uh, especially in the 19th century, and so I went on to study that, uh, particularly natural philosophy. And so I wrote my book, uh, De Natura e Natura, uh, about uh, the history of uh, nat natural philosophy uh, in Europe. And uh, from natural philosophy to political philosophy is a very short step. And so I did uh, idealistic political philosophy, also in uh, Germany. And these are all uh, nationalist uh, philosophers, starting with uh, Chamberlain uh, and uh, going through the Weimar Republic, uh, the conservatives of the Weimar Republic, and ending with uh, Alfred Rosenberg, uh, who was a national socialist idea. Mm -hmm. So you've been through the more or less the whole range of, uh, let's say, pre-Second World War uh, uh, philosophers uh, and uh, Literature, and it's uh, as I remember, you had concentrated a lot on the uh, uh, so-called anti-Semitic and actual actual anti-Semitic probably literature of the late nineteenth uh, century, yeah. and also later. Could you tell us a little bit about what that showed to you? Well, uh, all idealism is opposed to uh, uh, Judaism uh, and uh, Jewish thought. So uh, it is very, very clearly uh, um, indicated in these um, idealistic uh, political philosophers. 
uh, and it, uh, it is uh, a point of view that I sympathize with because uh, I know from my own study of Indian philosophy that uh, Judaism is completely opposed to it, completely different uh, from it. And uh, so when I studied uh, idealistic political philosophy, that's conservative political philosophy, I naturally also studied the anti-Semitic uh, German thinkers. Kimmy, uh, follow of Medigli. I, I would like to just read a few of the, of the titles here. They're pretty, um, um, rather long titles, uh, which would suppose uh, it's natural when it's uh, very scholarly works. Um, give, maybe gives the audience a, a little bit of an, an inkling of what, what kind of, a, of a deep studies you've done in, 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 in these areas. Like, um, there was here, Reconstruction, a rec Etman, a reconstruction of the solar cosmology of the Indo-Europeans. And um, we have one here, Henry Moore's A Platonic Song of the Soul. Henry Moore's Manual of Metaphysics. We skip a little bit because you already told us about uh, Houston Stuart Chamberlain political ideals, Alfred Rosenberg political essays, then Europa, German conservative foreign policy from 1870 to 19, 1940, and, and, and on and on. Many, many titles. One I've read is Eugen Buren on the Jews. Very interesting. And would actually um, would be very nice to have that um, translated, of course, in other languages. Uh, there's one which is which uh, bears pretty much on on our on our seminar the title of that, which was uh, the revolt against civilization. You have one here which is the rule of the inferior from 1930. Right. Well, what is the rule of the inferior here? Well, I would assume it was uh, Weimar. Uh, conservative, uh, and uh, he uh, was opposed to the uh, current uh, uh, rulers of, of the day, and uh, so he actually um, uh, was an advisor to Papen, uh, who was uh, course, uh, connected with the Reich. Uh, but he was against National Socialism, and so he was assassinated <coughs> by Hitler uh, during the Night of the Long Knives. Mm -hmm. um, so there are many strands of conservatism uh, that were developed uh, before the Second World War, and uh, his is a major strand because uh, Weimar conservatism is, is quite well known. I see. So both on the account of, uh, of anti-Semitism, the Jewish problem, um, the culture of uh, Europe as we uh, have it today compared with what was before the Second World War, you're pretty well qualified to have an opinion on what we see today. Um, could you tell us a little bit, what, what did you get out of the, uh, uh, of the seminar we had here? Did you, could you just in a few words, maybe not so few words, tell us what did we reach there? Well, there were many uh points of view expressed by many different speakers. Uh, I don't think uh, there is uh, one common uh, uh, viewpoint that, that marked the entire conference. Uh, because um, I spoke about uh, what I'm uh, most interested in, and that is the decay of culture universally uh, after the war, uh, something uh, radical has happened uh, as a result of the war and the colonization of Europe by America and Russia and this has had far reaching uh, effects uh, around the world through the spread of democracy particularly uh, as far as India which is also suffering uh, from this post war uh, post world war uh, trauma um, that is what uh, I'm interested in, that is what I spoke about uh, using uh, uh, a book written by uh, Hans Jürgen uh, Zuberberg. Um, the other I spoke about very different things. Um, um, Professor MacDonald spoke about something very similar uh, to what I discussed, and that is the effect of the Frankfurter Schultz. 
in uh, in America particularly because uh, I mean Frankfurt School um, emigrated from um, Germany to America and then uh, conducted its work its uh, cultural Marxism uh, in America. Um, apart from that, uh, I really can't say very much about the other lectures because uh, I'm not uh, specialized in these subjects. Professor Newborg uh, spoke about IQ, which I'm not interested in at all because uh, I don't think it's an indication of any cultural development at all. And uh, uh, it is just a modern American um, phenomenon, uh, like psychoanalysis, uh, which is also, uh, you know, uh, spread in America and the rest of the world um, after the war. So uh, I cannot say much more about that. And uh, the others were about completely different subjects. Uh, um, so um, I don't think there's a common strand. In the conference. All right, I see. Um, so Americanism, in its in its uh, different uh, uh, aspects, is what you see as the uh, main evil today. What what would you suggest uh, Europe does? I mean, we are totally uh, influenced by American culture. If you would call it a culture, you probably wouldn't. Um, uh, and what can we do about that? What would you suggest we can do? Well, I mean, one thing is clear, and that is Europe has to become independent of America. Uh, it is now too closely tied to it, especially through Britain, which is the closest ally of America. Uh, Britain is actually a far greater uh, uh, nation than America ever will be, but it uh, contents itself with uh, acting a subservient role in this alliance that they have with America. And through uh, Britain, uh, this influence of America spread all over the continent. Um, so uh, the uh, divorce of Europe from America uh, is a condition for the continued development of Europe uh, as, uh, as Europe. And uh, if uh, Western Europe needs any assistant, it must seek it from Russia and not from uh, America, because the Russians are Europeans and uh, natural kin of all the Slavic nations uh, in uh, the eastern part of the present European Union. Is that America true? is not a natural kin of any of the European nations, not even Britain. Is that because, uh, um, like uh, I think it was uh, Dr. Sunik said that the Americanism, which he's also treated in his book, uh, uh, was it Homo American Americanus? What he says is the uh, personification, I think, uh, of the Jewish spirit, something like that. Mm -hmm. Is that is that because America has become so much so Jewish uh, that I mean that's uh, it's it's like being governed through. Uh, is right. uh, through Israel, or by, governed by the U.S., but actually by the, the Jews uh, through right. the U.S. Right. It has uh, been completely uh, dominated by them, and uh, I don't see what they can do about it. Uh, so it's best to leave them to their own devices. Mm. Is, it, is it realistic at all with you know with our, our implication with the NATO and and mm. and, and, and the general? Uh, good feeling about Americans and the, 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 like the free people as, as, as opposed to Russia which has this bad uh, PR uh, image. Uh, this is all propaganda and uh, the Russians are much nicer people uh, than the Americans uh, generally. I mean, uh, not the American people but the American uh, government and the ruling elite uh, and so on, the intelligentsia. So uh, this is uh, just the effect of propaganda. Uh, and uh, as for the alliance with NATO, it, it can be broken, should be broken. Uh, the European Union, or Europe, whatever the, the new Europe uh, is called, must have its own armed forces and can seek support from Russia if it needs be, and so on. And uh, as for freedom, uh, you don't need to be taught freedom uh, by the Americans. 